our attention and our heart is upon you. We love you and only you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Well, what a joy it is to be back again. Man, it's been so good. And uh, I've got a, quite a bit of time away this year. Some of it's holidays and some of it's missions and some of it's ministry, a bit of a mix. Been kind of saving it up over the last three years. And then suddenly it's all on this year. And uh, so things we'd planned, we now have to, we've got them all organized to happen this year. But uh, we've just been away and had a, a, a family anniversary, our own anniversary. Uh, did a, some time up in Europe on a cruise. But then we went to, I went to Pakistan and we've had an amazing uh, time there. Absolutely phenomenal time. And uh, what's happened in Pakistan really is uh, much of it is the fruit of what uh, David has uh, sowed and, and, uh, and put into that place. And it's just really wonderful to see how the ministry of, of, of a seeing global church sowing in sacrificially to pay for a satellite television and to send Dave and Kate and their family up there. Now it's become a global ministry that's impacting millions and millions of people. It really is extraordinary. I really want to honor the sacrifice of the church and, uh, and Dave and Caden going up there to do that. And so we had, uh, uh, the day before we got there, there was a uh, uh, terrorist attack. Ten soldiers were killed. Uh, not far from where we were doing all the, the work up there. And so the government was bringing enormous pressure to shut everything down. And so Pastor Amwell had to stand up and push back and, and, uh, and had the team people praying uh, that it would be peaceful and we'd get uh, through okay. And uh, so he was able to persuade the government to allow him to hold the pastors and leaders conference and then the two crusades. So for the Pastors and Leaders Conference, we had 7,000 pastors and leaders coming from all over the nation, a first in Pakistan history. No one has ever been able to bring them together like that before. Absolutely extraordinary. Many of them have never heard of the supernatural, seen the supernatural, and then the miracles just broke out. We had so many people who were touched and ministered to, and many, many miracles and testimonies of miracles and, and impartation. It was just phenomenal. And then we went from there and did two crusades. The, uh, first, the crusade the first night, there were over 400,000 people, primarily probably 80% or more in Muslim, all out to hear the gospel. And uh, it was just a phenomenal experience and police. But there was not a single incident. Nothing went wrong. We went into that conference and uh, on that night, uh, and the next night we had uh, 350 plus thousand people out. It's hard to comprehend it, the, the number of people out in, in there. And uh, it was just, it was phenomenal to see the response. We had over 500,000 first time decisions for Christ, which is extraordinary, just amazing time. A really amazing time. And then multitudes of miracles and deliverances and all kinds of things happening. Uh, people born deaf, their deaf ears open up and they could hear clearly. People that were blind, the blind could see, lame could walk. Just every kind of miracle you could imagine. Just absolutely phenomenal. And I think what is, is the thing that's amazing is to see so many people jammed, literally jammed together in the, in the heat, hungry for God. We went to the church on Sunday, and you, you just couldn't move in among the crowd because it was so jammed together. And uh, that was the kind of crowds Jesus had. People jammed together. The word they use is thronged, means they crushed him virtually. And uh, so people were everywhere crying out to have hands laid on them, crying out for someone to pray for them and minister to them. And uh, just so many uh, uh, major needs among them. It's just wonderful to see, uh, firstly, what we've sown here having such huge and global impact. And also to see the enormous influence of Pastor Anwar from every level, government right down through to right across the board. And uh, just amazing, amazing time. So uh, we can get some pictures up another time. But uh, I just love seeing what God's doing in uh, Ethiopia. So if, if you look at what the church has done over the years, is what's happened is God has given us divine connections. Just astonishing divine connections. And uh, we had a connection uh, with John Wandera. And it came very simply. I was just kind to a man who was gardening at a pastor's conference. 
and I discovered he was from Uganda, discovered uh, he'd come out believing God uh, was going to bring him to New Zealand, believing that God would uh, connect him with a pastor here. And so he become, I, and the immediately all said, that's, that's you. So we took him home, and uh, then we have sown as a church. So as a church, we raised quite a lot of money. We sent Bryden and uh, Andy uh, overseas to do a, an exploratory visit and to make the way. We did crusades. We bought land. We helped them with building, and Joe and I have helped also with put, putting up a house over there. We set up a Bible school over there. We sent a woman's team led by Pastor Joy and uh, got a, a Bible school going there. And now there's uh, over 500 churches planted. I think there's about 500 planted uh, or, or more in one country in Sudan and there's a whole heap more in Uganda and a whole heap more in Kenya. So just it's hard to comprehend when you sow the seed how big the outcome can be when God is in it. And then what we've seen is happening in, uh, in, uh, in Pakistan, the phenomenal impact globally of a small church relatively in Hastings. And then now we've sown into, you know, we had the conference up in Auckland, which uh, cost quite many thousands of dollars. But as a consequence of sowing that and just making it a gift, we had gifts come in of $185,000. And we've been able to sow to get the whole of the school building and the educational program off the ground. So what you've got to see is it's not just something that's uh, just sort of just something that happened that you didn't know about. It's actually a seed has been planted that will have a huge impact on millions of people. It's kind of got to think out of small, what about me and my needs and can I even cope, and into getting God's heart for a global harvest. This is... In the, next, in the next decade, the Bible says very clearly, and, and uh, I want to get distracted, but if, we, if you look at what the Bible says, it talks specifically about the times we live in, and God says that I will shake everything that can be shaken. Yeah. And so if you think you've been shaken, there's more shaking coming in the next decade. Massive amounts of global shaking as we start to move into God's end time, uh, the manifestation of his purposes. And with that shaking, there will also come a readiness of people to receive the gospel. This will be a massive harvest time, and the church has to be prepared to sow and to invest in the harvest of souls. And there will be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we've never seen before, then the return of the Lord. So we're living in very exciting times, but we've got to constantly lift our vision off ourselves and onto the harvest of winning souls to Christ. You say amen to that? Amen. God bless. Turn to someone next to you. Say, there's someone you should win for Christ, I'm sure. <laughs> Amen. Well ahead, you've had outstanding time. I'm so sorry to miss it all, but however, I had my own fun. <laughs> Whenever you're walking with God, there's fun to be had everywhere. I can tell you now. Now, last time I think I ministered in the church, I, I began a series, but because of schedule changes, couldn't continue and uh, whatever. And I talked about honor, which you're doing as a study in the, in the meetings and so uh, in, in the small groups. And uh, what I want to do is just do a second in that series. And I want to this focus, I want to focus this one called Defeating Dishonor. Defeating Dishonor. And uh, because honor is a very big thing in the kingdom of God, uh, but defeating dishonor is very important for us, as, you, as you'll see in a moment. Let me just give you a scripture to start with. And uh, we read in Hebrews 12 verse 1, because if you want to defeat dishonor, you need to uh, focus your eyes of your heart and your life on Jesus, not on what other people are doing. What they should have done, could have done, didn't do. You don't worry about that. And what you need to focus on Jesus. Therefore, since uh, Hebrews 12, 1, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every hindrance, every weight, every hurt, every hurt, and the sin that so easily ensnares us, which is unbelief, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. So we're on a marathon race. Our journey with the Lord is a marathon race. You want to end the race well. You want to end the race. If you can end well, that's even better still. But you do want to end. I've seen so many start and they didn't end. And then the, the way we end the race well, it says looking or keeping the focus of your eyes upon Jesus Christ. If you look at people, people will let you down. They're wired to let us down at some point in our lives. No matter how nice and good people are, there's always some aspect that will let us down. It's just how it is. Get used to it. 
If you keep your eyes on Jesus, he will never fail. He's the author and finisher of our faith. That means he started you off, but he's also got to grow your faith as well. And for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame or despising the dishonor, and are set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How about that? So we're to finish or to focus our attention on Jesus. If you experience dishonor, then consider him who was hated and despised and rejected and suffered so many things. He is to be the focus of our attention. And in focusing on him, he is the example of how to handle dishonor, how to handle rejection, how to handle the things that come against us. Notice it says, it says for the, it says he despised or he considered nothing being dishonored by people. Now we all get upset and offended and angry and irritated and we get all kinds of issues because people dishonored us in some way and Jesus considered it to be nothing. Why did he consider it to be nothing? Because it isn't nothing. When you're dishonored, it hurts. And I'll show you how it hurts in various ways. But he said it's nothing compared to the joy, the honor, that is set before us if we overcome it. It's nothing compared to what God has prepared for us if we overcome being dishonored in life. Because if you're dishonored in life, it can lead to a change course and direction for your life and lead you away from and out of the purposes of God. Or it can be the catalyst for God raising you up and putting honor on your life. You choose which it is. You choose when you're in a place of being dishonored, whether you become offended and hurt and angry and and stay in that valley of sadness and sorrow and weeping, or whether you process the dishonor and it becomes the catalyst to promote you and lift you up where God can use you in a greater dimension. Now, no one makes that choice but you. How about that? How about that? See? How about that? So I want to go through and look at some of this. And so so as, we, as, we, as we start to look at it, we just need to get back in mind what honor is. And I want to just revisit just honor a little. And then I want to get on to dishonor. And so we just understand what it is and that it's common everywhere in life. And so you've got to learn to recognize it and then how to actually face and overcome it. Otherwise, it'll defeat you. So when we, when we consider honor, the word honor means just to fix a value on, to fix a value on someone, to consider of value, to consider it or hold someone in high esteem. The word in the Bible is used weighty, substance. So something that, something that you honor, you put up on a mantle piece in a nice place, something you dishonor, you kick in the corner. That's probably the way. So, so honor is something you place the value. And uh, so honor, uh, from a biblical point of view, is a gift we give to people. Yeah. Honor is a gift if people have to win. Now, in the world, people are honored for a whole range of reasons. People are honored because of the position they hold, and it's right we honor that position. People are honored because of their achievement, and it's right we honor people's achievement. This whole thing of mediocrity and, and, and trying to make everyone equal and have equal outcomes, it's just ungodly antichrist. Because in the kingdom of God, nothing works like that. See, so when people achieve, we should honor their hard work and their achievement and appreciate it. See, uh, we also honor character. If someone shows courage and bravery and endurance in a very difficult time, we honor their character that was revealed during the hard time. How about that? And uh, then finally, we honor people just because they are people, they are image bearers, they're made in the image of God. Now, they may be broken, but they still are image bearers. So if I got a $100 note and I crushed it up, crinkled it up, put it on the dirt, stomped all over it until it's buried in the dirt and pull it out, it is still a $100 note. The fact that it's untidy and doesn't look good and it's not in its best state right now does not change its intrinsic value. That makes sense? So when you see people, people are broken. People are damaged. We're damaged by sin, the sins of ourselves, our own sin and the sins of others, and it has an effect on us to devalue us. 
But that doesn't change at the core of our being. We're made in the image of God who loves us and has a destiny for us. So when you look at people and how people present themselves and how they treat you, it's very easy to be hurt, wounded, offended, and suffer and experience deep dishonor unless you fix your eyes on God and get his perspective for how to see people and see life. If you don't look through the eyes of God and see how he views these things, then you will be offended and it will affect you negatively. So honor. So honor is incredibly important uh, and the reason, many reasons it's important. I'll just list a few of them. Firstly, honor is the culture of heaven. In other words, placing value on people is the culture of heaven. You want heaven to come to earth? Practice placing honor on people, valuing people, acknowledging people. Uh, Not only that, honor is what we're created for. We were created as beings of honor in the image of our Father. Our problem is we're conscious of sin more than conscious of God. Uh, Honor, when you honor people, you draw out the best in them. So whatever gift you've got in, in you, people honoring you or being in a community that honors that will draw it out. That's why if you're a believer, you need to be in a Christian community that values you as a believer and draws out the very best in you. If you're in a community of unbelievers, they will despise and hate the Christianity and certainly not draw it out, do everything they can to extinguish it. So honor, uh, when we honor people, it gives favor and access. So I have phenomenal favor and access that no money can buy. I I have access to people that was given to me because of honor. There's just no other way that you could describe it. So uh, I notice, I I won't say this, but I had a situation recently where someone was... uh, uh, you know, just, just feeling as though they were devalued and were reacting. And when I sowed honor into them, there was a total change in their way of connecting to me. Instead of reacting, I just honored them and valued them and showed it in a practical way. And there was a shift in them because honor works. Honor works. Honor is a kingdom thing. Honor is not flattery. Honor is authentic. So when, we, when there's honor, it fills the whole atmosphere with life. So a culture or a house or a church where we honor the leaders and honor one another and value one another and honor God, it becomes filled with life. That's, how, that's what honor does. See, without it, it's like, it's, like, it's like the breath of life. Without honor, you can't thrive. So if people don't value you or dishonor you and consistently treat that way, you can't thrive uh, relationships without honor th- wither and die. So if you have a look at, at why marriages wither, there's probably lots of reason. But if I could put the single one that would be the most important one is there with familiarity over time, there came dishonor. And in dishonor, the relationship cannot thrive and it just withers. You've got to keep honor alive. Honor and value of your spouse alive. When you uh, are coming together, you see all the great things. When you're married, you see the other side. And you have to overcome that and learn to still honor and value the spouse God has given you because your relationship will thrive. Without honor, with disrespect, dishonor, poor treatment, not listening, not caring, then the relationship just withers and dies. Honor keeps relationships alive. Dishonor, it dies. So, and withholding honor can lead to enormous setbacks in your life. That's why the Bible says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that life may go well for you, implying that withholding honor from your parents will have an overflow of negative consequences in your life that you cannot work out. Okay, that's honor. So so what about dishonor? Well, dishonor is just the exact opposite. Dis, without, or to remove honor. So dishonor, dishonor. So uh, dishonor, of course, is, it, means to, it, means, or it means to place little or no value. See? To place little or no value. So when a person walks into the church, and this is their first time here, if you smile and come up to them and shake their hand and introduce yourself and make them welcome, you are communicating honor. If you just get busy talking to your own mates, then you show dishonor a lack of value on the person who is having their first experience being among God's people here. 
Quite practical, isn't it? Eh? So, so, so to dishonor means you, sh- you, you despise or, or you uh, have placed little value on, or it means to withhold honor when it's actually due. So you dishonor people when you ho- withhold. You just don't give it. So honor is your decision. You give it. People don't have to earn it. You give it to them by treating them as someone of value. It has more to say that, about you than anything else. So the word dishonor also means like to treat someone like vapor. There's nothing to them. They're just nothing. So, so dishonor then is a life experience. How many have been dishonored in some way? How many have been dishonored? Come on. And that's right. Everyone has. It's part of life because we live in a sinful world. The, lo- the loss of, uh, of our relationship with God introduced that. So, however the thing. So, so the two things then. One is everyone experiences dishonor. Everyone. At some point, you were overlooked. At some point, they didn't listen. At some point, they misunderstood. At some point, you were badly treated. At some point, you forgot to be treated right. It just just happens. It's called life. Welcome to the world. It's not heaven. It's called a sinful, broken world under demonic influence. So it's going to happen. And if it's already happened and hurt you, I can let me give you an insight. There's more coming up. (laughs) How about that? It just is part of life. Now get this, here's another thing that you need to understand that God uses circumstances of dishonor to prepare you for promotion. I better say that again. God uses circumstances of dishonor to prepare you for honor or promotion by him. And the key is how you respond. You can either overcome the dishonor and the bad treatment and the way people handled you or didn't handle you right and rise above it and show yourself to be a person of honor and God can lift you up. And there are so many examples. In fact, the whole of the Bible is full of what's called honor reversals where people were in a place of honor, then suddenly they're in a place of great disgrace and shame and dishonor and then they handle themselves right and God lifts them up again. The Bible's full of it. It's so full of it, it's a principle. So if you can get that, you can understand, I really do need to get to overcome and defeat any forms of dishonor. Don't let it take root in me and cause me to become an angry person. You look at it, you'll start to see in the Bible, you'll see it's a part of God's process to prepare you and qualify you for great honor because that's his plan for you. So have a look at Moses. Moses, Moses was dishonored. They tried to kill him. And they got raised him up and put him up into a training program in the Pharaoh's palace. He's honored. And then when he tries to fulfill his call, he ends up running away as a fugitive in the wilderness, dishonor. And then God raises him up and he becomes the deliverer of the nation. So you see, honor, dishonor, honor. Joseph, he's in his family, he gets these dreams, wonderful dreams from God. Honor. His father puts a coat on him, honor. The brothers, when he's honored, they do what most people, brothers do. They were envious and jealous and they wanted to get him. And so they got him. They were gonna kill him and then they decided to sell him. So dishonor, he sold as a slave, stripped naked, put on a market and sold to the, to the highest bidder. And then when he's starting to do well and being lifted up, then he's accused falsely of rape and put in a prison. So he goes right down to the bottom of the prison. Now, you, now, there's a no way out. And when you're in the place of dishonor, you can't honor yourself to get out. You need someone to put honor back on you. Anyone who honors themselves, it's not real honor. That's the thing. You know, you can repent and ask for forgiveness of sin and put it right. But with honor, if you're in a place of shame, you can't put the honor back on your life. Others put it on you. God puts it on you. So we need to see God as our source of honor. And so what happened to him? He's in the lowest place. I mean, accused of rape, accused of all kinds of things. And he's there rotting in prison. And then overnight, God lifts him up and sets him next to the Pharaoh. And he becomes one who can then actually bring salvation to Israel and continue the purpose of God. So God gives him honor so God can fulfill his plan. That's not that he's just suddenly raised up overnight. That's the thing you see. The thing you didn't see was what happened in his heart while he's being dishonored. 
It says, the word of the Lord tried him. He hung on to God's word and believed that God would put it right in due course. See, David, David started off pretty good. Well, he didn't start off good. I'll just pick up one aspect. After he killed Goliath, he was in a place of great honor. Everyone thought he's one of them. He began to sing around them. And they sang so many songs about him that Saul got jealous. And that's what happens when people get lifted up. And so what did he do? He became a fugitive and there's a price on his head and even his friends are killed. That's the lowest you can get. That's a place of total dishonor for the man who saved Israel. But God was using it to prepare him. And when he was ready, suddenly overnight, and and actually went through Ziklag and 1 Samuel 30, everything was taken away from him. Everything was lost. Even the people near him wanted to turn on him and kill him. But David strengthened himself in the Lord and God spoke to him. And he got everything back and suddenly he goes into favour. It's like overnight, suddenly he's anointed king. So he goes from being, I've lost everything, to next he's in a place of, he's the king. So so that's called an honour reversal. We're in a place of shame and then without any warning, suddenly honour starts to come to you. You lift it up, people start to favour you and draw near to you and you've got no idea and can't put it down to anything you did. God lifted you up. What about Jesus? We just look here, considering Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. Consider him. In other words, make him your focus, how he handled dishonor. Because he's, if, he, if he's the one who's handled dishonor, and it says, and wherefore God has exalted him and given him a name above every other name, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. So you notice he went to dishonor when he died on the cross. Now, highest honor. So this situation of honor reverses all through the Bible. And the key is not whether you get dishonored or disrespected or devalued. The key is what you do with it. And that's your decision. No one else's decision. Okay, so I want to talk then about uh, dishonor a little bit more. And, uh, and, and there's a reason why dishonor is so devastating. Dishonor is incredibly devastating. I've had massive dishonor throughout my life in ministry. Massive dishonor. But I've learned how to overcome it all. Yeah. And then suddenly God just puts the honor without even knowing, hello, I didn't do anything. And suddenly God blesses you and helps you and there's a breakthrough or kindness is shown or whatever. But the thing about dishonor, dishonor... Uh, actually deeply wounds and can offend people when you're dishonored, when you're devalued, when you're uh, despised, where you're put to shame, where you're treated badly, it does wound. And you've got to learn how to deal with your wounds. That grows your character. So, so dishonoring people violates the culture of heaven. Every time you dishonor another person, you violate the culture of heaven and grieve the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Dishonor creates a toxic culture where people wither. In fact, honor is so important that in marriage, God says to men, better honor your wife or your prayers are not going to be listened to. Well, how many knew that verse? So some guys, if you're struggling with your prayer life, first thing is perhaps have a look at how you're treating your spouse. It says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, or in other words, make it your purpose intentionally to get to understand them because they're different. They're not a guy in a woman's body. They're a woman. <laughs> see? Understand them. See? Then, and then <laughs> giving honor to them. Giving honor to them. So it's a gift. You give them honor. As unto a weaker vessel. It doesn't say they're weak. It just says, as if it was to a weaker vessel, you give honor and value. He says, knowing two things. One, you are sharers of the grace of life. And two, your prayers will be hindered. In other words, your dad, when he looks down and sees you mistreating your wife, will say, well, I'm not listening to you. Because you're not listening to her. So your prayers are going nowhere. That's why a lot of guys get disheartened. They don't realize part of their prayers getting answered is the fact they occupy a place of uh, honor and value upon their spouse. Just the room, just the air sucked out of it almost. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be, a whole, that'd be a whole teaching session of its own. Mate, it'd be quite a good for you to have a discussion when you go home. If you had the courage to ask your wife, 
Are there any ways you feel I've dishonoring to you in the way I treat you? Hey, might be good. I mean, you could say, God, why aren't you answering my prayers? And when you read the Bible, it tells you why. So then you ask your wife, are there any ways I'm offending and dishonoring you? And you put that right, and then suddenly your prayer life takes off. Come on, honor is important to God. It's the culture he lives in. Here's the thing. If you dishonor God, he won't even come near you. You can pray and sing and do all you want, but it's not going to bring any difference. It's honor. Honor. Jesus said when you come to prayer, our Father in heaven, we honor your name. Yeah, come on. That's why coming to them, coming to church on time and participating, it's all about honor. If, if you don't understand it's about honor and bringing a gift to a king, then you don't understand what you're doing and you don't get any benefit out of it. You've got to understand it's all about honor, giving to God something due to him. And, and that's how we come. We always come in the presence of the king with honor. Okay, so how are people dishonored? Well, there's a multitude of ways. I couldn't begin to list them. And, and it's either by people intentionally mistreating you wrongly and unjustly. So it can be intentional. People deliberately did it to you through their words and their actions. Could be that way. Or it can be just unintentional neglect. They're just are ignorant and don't know better. Some people are just ignorant. They just don't know better because they've never been raised differently. So they don't know how to build a culture of honor in the marriage and family. Their family wasn't like that. It was toxic. So that means you've got to learn what to do to build a great marriage and family. To learn means you actually set yourself to do something to learn. Don't do what you used to do or what you've grown up with. Do something different. <laughs> okay. So, so people are dishonored when we won't listen to them. One of the greatest ways you can honor a person is to listen to them and hear their journey. That shows you are of value. I'm not going to judge you. I would like to come near you and listen and hear where you are in your story. That's one of the greatest ways you show value. Okay. Well, you're getting quiet when we get onto this here, isn't it? Eh? So, so wh who, where do we get devalued? Well, everywhere pretty well. <laughs> it starts off in family. And uh, it can be with parents, can be siblings. Siblings are notoriously for dishonoring their, their fellow siblings, especially boys. Man, just so competitive. And so I win and you get put down. That's really what it's all about. So there's winners and losers. The loser is mocked and the winner feels great and dishonor abounds. And underneath all of that, there's hidden resentment. <laughs> it happens at school. School is notorious for dishonor. Parents, uh, teachers, the way they treat some, some teachers, how they treat their students. And I can remember being terribly dishonored in a classroom. It bites in deep. It hurts to have someone standing over you in that's in authority shouting at you and abusing you and running you down in front of a class of your peers. That, that's incredibly dishonoring and deeply wounding. But also at school, there's bullying. And bullying is incredibly dishonoring. And I, I can remember vividly experiences of being bullied at school. Terrible experiences. See, so these, these things all affect us. All affect us. It can happen in marriage. It can happen in relationships. It can happen at work. It can happen in organizations. It happens even in church. Because churches are people on a journey. And so they're not perfect or complete. And they don't behave well a lot of the time. Think about that. And uh, so let me just then look at some common sources or a couple of common sources. One is what I would call honor-shame cultures. Now, the Western culture is pretty well a law-based culture, but, but the rest of the world is an honor-shame-based culture. And so, for example, Pacifica and, and Maori culture is an honor-shame uh, culture. In other words, honor is the highest value. People don't want to lose face. And uh, shame is a very serious issue. And so uh, in those kind of cultures or in that culture, it's neither good nor bad. It just reflects one aspect of what man lost and how we try and reconstruct it at the fall. And so honor in those cultures is always from, uh, it's always upwards. It's never downwards. It's always towards those who are above you. And people down the line are treated with less value. And they're often dishonored and neglected, not listened to in many ways, and taken advantage of and exploited. And that creates deep wounding. 
frequently uh, uh, people down the line are dishonoured by being ignored or by verbal, physical and sexual abuse. So this is deeply painful. It's not a God culture or a kingdom culture. It's a culture that's very destructive. Yeah, great qualities in it, but in those cultures, shaming and dishonoring are used to control people and make them compliant. And so in that, you get deeply wounded, deeply wounded. Now, it's not just Maori Pacifica, it's every culture that is like that all around the world. It's about 70% of the world is that way, all through Asia, all through Africa, all through South America. It's just, it's just the characteristics of that kind of culture. They have some wonderful qualities in the culture, but that's the downside is the shaming and dishonor. Now, New Zealand, of course, is a bit of a mix, but New Zealand has got some issues of culture which I find incredibly dishonoring. New Zealand culture... It's like a shrinking machine. It, it, it just shrinks people's capacity uh, unless you fight against it. And uh, for example, I don't know whether you realize that New Zealand has one of the worst records in all the OECD uh, countries for child abuse. Out of, a list, out of 41 countries, we're number 35 on the list. That's appalling. Meaning that within the culture, there is systematic and intentional abuse of children and dishonoring of them in a way that wounds and breaks them. That's, it's very, very serious. Uh, another aspect uh, of uh, our New Zealand culture is what I call familiarity. And so the warmth and casual nature is very positive, but familiarity where you lose respect for people and that's just mate, everyone's just mate. Actually, that's not the kingdom culture at all. You've got to watch because you become familiar. You lose respect, and that will shut down the person, your ability to receive from people and their ability to give. Not only that, there's across New Zealand a tendency for what's called an egalitarian mindset. And uh, egalitarian means we're all equal. Well, in the kingdom of God, every person is equal on the basis of what Christ did for us, but our status and standing varies. It's really different both now and in the coming kingdom. Your status in the coming kingdom, you're preparing for it now. Okay then, so uh, an egalitarian means we're all equal and the desire to have everyone equal, it's becoming an increasing pressure and it's often rooted in just low personal esteem and an envy at people what they have and resentment at their success or their money or their position. It leads to a culture of mediocrity. Quite, it's quite a shocking thing, really. And uh, it, it shows up in our culture as undermining male and female distinctives. And so both men and women are dishonored. When you don't value and honor male characteristics, then you dishonor men and you shut them down from functioning properly. And when you try to make women into men or say that men can become a woman... Come on, get over it. That is incredibly dishonoring to women that you could become a woman by dressing up and cutting some parts off. Come on. That's just actually an attack on womanhood and femininity and its value. It's a, it's a form of dishonor. It's a form of dishonor. It's abuse. Okay? Uh, another thing that's an issue in New Zealand is what uh, I would say uh, growing demands for equity. They want equal outcomes for everyone. Well, that, that means socialism. It's communism. Yeah. So if people work and achieve well and work hard, they should have a higher reward than those who don't. But this demand for equity is a Marxist, anti-Christ thing right. that appeals to people's sense of injustice and dishonor and tries to stop and undermine achievement. I, I think this is incredible. I, was, I remember teaching. I've never forgotten this. I was teaching a fourth form class, and it's quite a mixed group there mixed ethnic background, and, and it, there was a resistance to achievement. And I, I talked to one of the young guys, a Maori boy, and I said, what's up with this? He says, oh, it's a shame if you really do well in class. I said, what? And he was just saying that the, the way they viewed it was it was a shame if you got high marks in your class. I said, well, it's a shame to be poor. It's a shame to not qualify. It's a shame not to achieve. It's a shame to bury your talents because you're more concerned what people think of you. But I said, achievement is something we should all aspire to as a way of fulfilling the destiny God has given to us. And I saw many of them 
that they, were they that did work and achieved were embarrassed by the way they were treated by the rest of the class. That's kind of like a reverse achievement culture. How's that going to get anyone anywhere? So you, you kind of got it. So dishonor has got many forms, of course, many different ways it comes through. But one of the ways it comes through in New Zealand culture is through what you call the tall poppy syndrome. And this is a tall poppy syndrome is our legacy left over from uh, the, the class structure of England. And so it's in primarily in New Zealand and Australia. But it's simply this. Uh, it, it occurs when someone, uh, when someone is successful, people resent it and then criticize them. So someone achieves great. Well, who they think they are anyway? Think you're better than us. Hello, what's that? That's just envy and resentment and dishonor. And, and see, that kind of culture stops people achieving. So people who are, who are uh, great abilities and talents leave New Zealand to go where they will be valued and what they have will be drawn out of them. Well, you know, it's just what it is. So, so ambition and excellence are devalued. But you need to have ambition and drive. You need to have some dreams and goals. You need to pursue something worthwhile with your life. And you need to work to excellence and not accept mediocrity. All of that is a part of, of life. Eh? So uh, cutting people down devalues other people's achievement. And says, it tells them that it communicates they didn't deserve it. Now, Jesus was criticized all his life. So Jesus understands this deep issue of dishonor, which is in every culture, and it's in every community. It happens in various ways and various levels. He understood it. And so the, he not only understood it, but he actually allowed himself to experience dishonor so he could then have compassion for us and lift us up out of dishonor. And so we see Jesus was dishonored in a number of different ways, many different ways. Look at this in Isaiah 53. He was despised, verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And even we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. That word despised, is a, it refers to dishonor. To hold in contempt or look down upon someone with disapproval to reject them as being unworthy and not valuable. How about that? He was despised and rejected. And I'll connect some of these things together in a moment. But he constantly experienced dishonor everywhere he went. Think about the circumstances of his birth. This is the creator of this world, the creator of all creation. And he comes into his own creation and he's born in a stable with animals he was threatened with death. He ends up a refugee in Egypt, foreign country, as a refugee. Terrible dishonor for the king, right from birth. Even his parents misunderstood him. He went to the temple at his age of 12 to prepare for his life training, and they didn't understand, and they told him to come back. So even they didn't understand him. And of course, don't expect it all went well in the family. It tells us that when he went out preaching and started to do it, his family stood at the door, beating on the door, and they came to Jesus saying, your family are out there. He says, they consider you're mad, and they want to restrain you and take you home. It's there. It's in Scripture. They considered him insane. How about that? Imagine your family think you're absolutely insane. Mark 3, 21. Considering him insane, they wanted to restrain him and drag him home and get him back in the family business. Do you understand? This is Jesus' own brothers and sisters he was raised with. He was the elder brother, and now he's a religious nut. And they're now considering him mad and trying to hold him back. So if you've had a little bit of that, hey, Jesus understands all of that. Are you a religious nut? You know, they've said of me, I got all religious. Yeah, really happy to be there. <laughs> okay, in his hometown, they, they, they looked at the hometown he came off. Now, I came from Danny Virk. You know, and Danny Virk, well, anyone knows Danny Virk, you know, you know Danny Virk. So I came out of Danny Virk, very small town, you know, country town. And this is what they said of Jesus Can any good come out of that town? Can anything good that would be anything impacting come out of such a little low town like that? And that's where Jesus was born and where he grew. It was such a small 
It's a little wee, even to this day. It's still a very despised place. It's his hometown. And when he came to his hometown, Capernaum, everyone was offended at him. So he came there to help them, and they were all offended at him and reject him. Now, this is called dishonor. So he experienced it all the way through. And uh, his disciples, well, he, he's got a whole crowd of disciples. In John 6, it says, he began preaching and telling them a bit of home truth, and they all got offended and walked away. So they didn't, they didn't honor and value who he was because they didn't understand what he was saying and it upset them. Instead of actually working it through, instead of working it through, they got offended, got the huff and took off. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> it just goes on and on, doesn't it? Jesus asked his disciples, I'm in a real deep trouble now. I'm really grieved. I'm about to go to my greatest challenge in life. Could you pray? They all fell asleep. How much value did they place on his suffering? No, I'm too tired. I can't handle this. Someone there, he's feeding, he's, he's had as his disciple, and then he's got him at the same table, and the disciple betrays him. Betrayal is one of the deepest forms of dishonor. Adultery is betrayal, dishonoring your spouse. Abandoning your family is dishonoring them. There are some tribes where abandonment by fathers of their children is, this, is, is a common thing. This is horrendous dishonor and brings a, 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 brings a cloak of dishonor and shame on the next generation. So, so dishonor is everywhere. So it happened. Of course, even the spiritual and political authorities, well, is it any better in the church? No, the political authorities and the church authorities got together, so we've got to kill this guy. See, they all despised. Everywhere Jesus went, he was a catalyst. You either loved him or hated him. They're not much in between. See, and finally he died on the cross. His own nation completely rejected him. The Bible says even his own nation didn't want him. He came to his own, his own received him not. In other words, even his whole nation rejected him at the end. Now that's pretty tough. That's, that's actually not a happy life, is it really? So how on earth do you survive when you go through such a hard time and it's like the pattern all your life. And then, of course, right at the very end, he went to the cross. Now, most people, when they think about the cross, think about the suffering. But the cross was actually intended by the Romans to be a form of dishonor of someone systematically. Every little aspect through the, the, the whipping, the distorting the body. So the body and the, the bowels just flood out like that. And, and the body's taught, distorted and taking him through the town and publicly displaying him, stripping him naked and hang him on a cross. And, and all, every aspect was to take away all honor and shame him and humiliate him publicly so no one would follow him. That was their intention, not just to kill him, but they could have poisoned him. Or they could have just put the sword in. But they wanted to actually intentionally remove all honor. So in Jesus, not only through his life, but at the very end of his life, the way he died was public humiliation and shaming, powerless, nailed to his cross, his body ripped apart and naked, Everyone passing by on the way into the city saw him on public display. He understands what dishonor is. And he took it on himself so that we could be free of it. And your freedom doesn't come by bearing it and trying to forget it and get over it. Your freedom doesn't come by uh, trying to uh, press on and try to get more. Your freedom comes by an encounter with Christ and resolving these things. So I won't go to too much detail. I want to give you just different ways that, that dishonor impacts people. This is how dishonor affects people. The first is it deeply wounds us. Notice it says of Jesus in Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected of men. There's the dishonor. A man of sorrows, fully intimate with grief. So when we are rejected, it has, when we're dishonored, it causes rejection, sorrow, or tears, or deep sadness, grief. It tells us in Isaiah 53, despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And look at this in, in David in Psalm 69. You know my reproach, my shame, my dishonor. Reproach has broken my heart. 
I am full of heaviness, or, or I like it in the Passion Translation, see how they dishonor me in shame and disgrace. Lord, you know what I'm going through. You see it all. And look at this. I am heartsick and heartbroken. Their contempt has crushed my soul. And I looked for compassion. Someone would care. Sympathy and compassion, but found only empty stairs. That is deep impact. A deep impact. Rejection, sorrow, grief, broken heart, crushed, abandoned, weary, and alone. See? When we, when we go through these kind of experiences, not only do people get wounded, but spiritual strongholds form. I have no value. And when you believe in your heart you have no value, then your thoughts don't have much value. Your dreams don't have any value. Your desires, your needs, your hurts, your concerns, none of them count. And then your voice doesn't count. I've got no voice. doesn't matter if I say anything. It's not going to count. No one will listen to me anyway. You understand? That is the deep impact in people's lives. I have prayed for many people who felt, I have no voice. If I speak, no one even hears me. This is because of, of, of bondage, a stronghold, and torment, torment by spirits. Dishonor caused you to lose your identity. You don't really know who you are because you've hidden it. In, in Genesis, when they felt shame and dishonor, they covered themselves with fig leaves and hid. And so people carrying dishonor conceal who they are, and they can never fully come forth until they've dealt with that dishonor because they've got to hide. Right? They usually feel they've got to please people so they can't pursue their own dream. This is a really serious thing. People are being dishonored, their gifts are quenched. They live in fear and anxiety. And often they develop a mindset of a victim. I'm powerless. Like, what can I do? I just is just who I am. And so the last thing that people do is having developed a victim mindset, well, you know, it's not my fault. These bad things happened to me. They happened to my family. They've happened to us. What could I do? I just need to blame someone and I need to look for someone to come through and help me out. Now you understand that in the Western world, that mindset has been cultivated through media, that you are powerless, that you're oppressed or treated unjustly. And so what happens is people get locked in an identity group I'm a victim. Someone has to be blamed, and I need someone to rescue me, and that'll be the government that'll bail me out. Listen, that, this, is, this is an ungodly mindset because you've experienced dishonor. And God wants you to break free of that way of thinking and realize, yep, I've had some tough times and tough treatment. Yep, I've had injustice. Yes, it's hurt. But I am not looking at men I am fixing my eyes on Jesus who endured more than I have and now God has exalted him and lifted him up. I'm going to follow his pattern. See? The last thing I've noticed about people who've been dishonored is this. This is a very common one. Very, very common. Is they struggle and strive to establish their own value. They promote themselves. See, in, in Proverbs 25, 27, it says it's good to be honored, but to seek words of praise from others, that's not honor at all. And so frequently I found that people who are dishonored, instead of resolving it, now they're on a quest to get honor. And so they put others down so they'll look better. When you put someone else down, you're not looking better, you're looking your worst. Think about that. They promote themselves, they exaggerate their achievements and project out of themselves that they're really important, really gifted, that they're really something. But that's all a mask. The real person is suffering from dishonor and trying to compensate for it instead of deal with it with God. People like that are constantly looking for validation and they get offended if you don't tell them how great they are, what they did. But God will see to it. There are times you're not thanked, you're not validated, you're just doing it in secret, and that will reveal what's in your heart. 
(laughs) Were you doing it for God or to get something? Was your whole basis of relationships a big transaction? I do this and you got to do that. That's not how the kingdom works. That's the way the world works. In the kingdom of God, we receive value and honor from God himself through an intimate union with Christ. We are loved. We are valued. We're part of a royal family. We have access to the supreme ruling authority in all the universe. And as a result of being loved, we can now honor and value people. We don't need anything from them. I don't need to manipulate to get favor. This is what's given me favor in so many places. I can go to the, 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 the households and the businesses of some of the wealthiest people in the world and there's nothing they have I want. I have something to give them. You understand? And they f- sense straight away no agenda. People in that kind of role, they sense an agenda immediately. But when we operate out of the kingdom, we give honor, we're generous, and we're kind because that's who we are, and that's how we represent our Father. See, when you live that way, now God can lift you up and use you because you're not going to use that promotion to exploit people for yourself. Hey, you're all getting real quiet on this stuff, aren't you? I'll give you a couple of keys then to finish with now. How do we overcome dishonor? Essentially, there's two parts to it. One is you need to bring resolution to the impact of dishonor in your own life. If you don't resolve it, it keeps festering. And every new dishonor stings and hurts and raises up the old pain. So the first thing that's so important is to face where you've been dishonored. That means you identify and acknowledge what's happened and how it's impacted you. It means you resolve it. You forgive the people. Grieve over it and forgive them and bless them. You grieve over it. Forgive them and bless them. There's real grief when you're dishonored. I have been in the presence of the Lord in a place of worship, and I become aware of where my, even just that situation I mentioned as a child, the bullying at school, the terrible dishonor and shame and embarrassment I felt And as I brought it out to the Lord, the deep weeping, something buried so long ago, still impacting me. And I forgave and then chose to bless. That's how you get out of it. You face it, you grieve over it, let God heal the wound, forgive the person and start to bless them. That's how you break out of this stuff. Don't go rehearsing it and telling someone else. Don't go holding it in, bring it out to the Lord. And sometimes part of your healing process is you need to set a boundary for people who disrespect you. And you you set the boundary by speaking up about how you feel and the changes you'd like to take place. Now, a lot of marriages need to do that. A lot of families, you need to do that because they disrespect you, dishonor you, and cause wound after wound after wound after wound. When are you going to stand up and stop it? When will you stop allowing people to dishonor you and disrespect you? When will you stand up when you process the stuff and understand, I don't have to put up with that crap. Stand up and say, when you do this, it affects me this way. I'd like this to change, please. And if they don't, then you limit their access. They go from VIP access to sitting on the outer seats. They don't get access like anymore. That's how you protect what when you do, when you set a boundary and stop people getting close to you because of the way they treat you and dishonor you, you're honoring yourself. You're saying, actually, I'm too valuable to let you treat me like that. Does that make sense? You've got to learn to do that. that that's the, so that's recovering. And then, then, then you need to make a decision to become a man or woman of honor. That you're not going to follow the path of our culture, whether it be Pacifica, on a shame culture, whatever it is, you're not going to follow the Kiwi culture. You're going to follow the culture of heaven and be a man, woman of honor that treats people with honor. See, when I saw John, a black man doing the gardening, I could have walked by and overlooked him, but by engaging him and honoring him, a whole opportunity opened to bring blessing to him and to impact thousands of people. Do you understand? It's in the simple little stuff of actually engaging 
and valuing people because they are wonderful. Difficult sometimes, but wonderful. So if you want to build a life and culture of honor, you do need to get established in the Word of God in what God says about you. If you don't get into the Bible and discover what God says, you're just continuing believing what people told you. You've got to actually renew your mind to see who am I? I'm a child of the living God. I'm redeemed. I'm loved. I'm accepted. I have access to the throne of my Father to stand in a place where His glory is, where the center of the governance of the universe is. I can have access there and I'm loved and welcome. So you've got to get the Word of God in you to get truth and set your affection there. You make a decision. You'll Seek the honor that comes from God. If people don't honor you, it doesn't matter. Honor from the world is temporary. Here today, gone tomorrow. Today you're on the stand. Hooray, hooray. Ah, good, tomorrow it's gone. But there's an honor that comes from God. And, and Jesus said, how can you believe or have faith if you seek the honor that comes from me and don't seek the honor that comes from God alone? God will honor those who honor Him. There's a promise there. He will honor you in this life and He'll honor you in the next. So what do you want? The honor of men? It comes and goes, and it's never enough. Or the honour of God, which sometimes is delayed, and it doesn't look good because you're in a mess, but in that delay, you lean into Him and love on Him, and you come out refined like Jesus was, ready to be raised up for your new promotion, your new area of influence, because in the time of dishonour, you didn't become bitter. You lent into God and wept and blessed and forgave and grieved. Let it all go. And you decided, I won't pay evil for evil. I will return evil with good. I'll be a man of honour. I'll treat people honourably. Can you say amen to that? See, it's a choice. Them that honour me, God says, I will honour. Jesus said, if you serve me, follow me. And those who serve me, them will my Father honour. So there is an honour God can give you and you haven't seen it yet. It's an eternal honour. So what do you want? Manipulate people in relationships to get a smile and a clap and a hooray? Or would you rather have that eternal honour that comes because of well-doing? God doesn't criticise us for seeking honour. It's where you seek it from and how you seek to get it is what counts. Why don't you become a man, a woman of honour? Let's just close your eyes right now. Feel the presence of God here. I know I've given you a lot, but then I'm not up so much, so I try to give you as much as I can. But right now, the thing I think the Holy Spirit is on is if you've suffered dishonour, maybe things that people did to you or withheld from you, or maybe things you did to yourself. Sin always brings dishonor. Sin is falling short of the glory or honor of God. So when we sin, we dishonor ourselves as well as God. We're just living below our value. That's not who we are. You're a man of value. You're a man of honor. I can tell because I looked at the price tag and last time I saw the price tag on you was the life of Jesus Christ. Woman, you're a daughter of honor in the family of the king. Why don't you throw off that dishonor you've had and choose to lean onto him? There's an honor that comes from God, being in his presence and walking with him. It can never be taken away. I've gone through so many experiences. I should write about them sometime with Christians, organizations, churches. Unbelievable stuff, really. You wonder how it happens. But every time I learn to do the same thing, go in the presence of God, acknowledge the pain. It is real. Grieve over it, forgive them, and then decide to bless them, pray for them, or give something to them. And be bigger than what was done to you. Are you big? Or have you shrunk? Are you caught in the shrinking machine of dishonor in our nation? Or is there something in you refuses to be crushed by it because you're born of something bigger and better and the spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you. And so whenever they put you down, you lean into God and He brings you up. And you come out the other side and they, no one knows how you did it. 
but it's because the roots of your heart were deeply rooted in the love of Christ. So right now, if there's issues of dishonor in your life, we're going to stand a moment as we finish worshiping. Why don't you come up to the front and say, God, today, I want that dishonor and reproach to go off my life. I want the shame to go off my life. I feel like it's wrapped around me and I'm never good enough. I, I'm going to break my agreement with a lie. I'm not good enough. That is a demonic lie based on my past failures and people's opinions. But Jesus said, he has made me accepted. And if I'm acceptable because of what he did, I'm going to believe that and abandon this other stuff. What do you make of this? Let's stand to our feet right now. If that's you, you've been dishonored in your family, never even wanted from the very beginning, treated as though something was wrong, treated as scapegoated in the family. Perhaps you're the younger one and you struggle because of that. You're just the young one. No one takes any notice of you. There's lots of ways we get dishonored. Perhaps you were abandoned by a parent, hurt physically, verbally, sexually. Perhaps there's been abuse of various kinds in your life and you say, God, I'm not going to wear this shame any longer. I'm coming. Just come right now. Come to the front. Not for someone to pray as much as to bring it to Jesus. I want you to fix the eyes of your heart on Jesus. Sometimes to do it, I just kind of see the cross. I begin to use my imagination as I pray to picture the cross. And I kneel before the cross and I begin to look and see the blood shed for me, the nails for me, his skin all lacerated for me, his heart broken so mine could be healed. The shame of his nakedness, so my shame could be removed. Come. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy of you being healed and raised into a place of honor, he endured the cross on your behalf. despising the dishonor and shame of it all because of the great victory ahead. Consider him who endured such hostility. How did he do it? 1 Peter 2 says, he committed the keeping of his soul to his father. And when he was abused, he didn't abuse back. He just committed his soul to his father and remained silent. That's the same one that everyone dishonored that will return in glory and everyone will bow to him. That's him. He did this for you so you could be raised to honor. Right now as you just stand there, why don't we just begin to worship the Lord? In the presence of the Lord, things happen, miracles happen. Is this something that's really dishonored you? Why don't you, if it's something you did, just repent of it right now. So Jesus, I'm so ashamed of what I did. I can't seem to get over it, but Lord, your word declares if I confess it, you will forgive me and cleanse me. So I bring this thing to the cross that I feel so ashamed of. What I've been doing in secret, what is done in secret, I bring it to the cross. If there's something has happened to you that's brought dishonor to you, then bring that to the cross. Bring that person to the cross and say, God, they have hurt me deeply and dishonored me, but I forgive them. I forgive them and I bless them. I release them now. Lord, remove my dishonor and shame. I receive an impartation of your life and glory. Come on, let's sing the song now as we sing. Prepare your heart to receive. I'm going to pray a prayer in a moment. We're going to lay hands. Why don't we get our prayer team or people that are here that are been asked to minister, why don't you come on up and why don't you come up now? Come forward now. Get ready to pray for people. Those who put their hope in Him shall never be ashamed. Lord, today I come up out of the valley. I reject the shame and dishonor. I reject now the word spoken. 
I rejected control. I bring these things to the cross. I forgive from my heart. They didn't know what they're doing. I bless them. And today, Jesus, I fix my eyes on you, who for the joy ahead endured the cross, despising it, considering it nothing for the joy that was ahead. Jesus, I honor you. Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we take authority of the spirits of rejection, shame, grief, abandonment. We break their power now. We release the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Ghost. Fall upon people with your healing power. In Jesus' mighty name. You're watching online. Presence of God is there to heal you. I see people weeping because of what you've gone through in secret. I see people weeping because you've been abused, because you were never wanted and felt it all your life, because you were never listened to, because you were neglected, abandoned. God is healing you right now. He's setting you free of tormenting spirits. The power of God is flowing to you now. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it. 